Being an ATF agent, I take pride in working violent crime. And I think we have one of the toughest jobs in the country in law enforcement. He is a dedicated and deeply religious man who relies on his faith when the going gets tough. You know, I believe everything happens for a reason and a purpose, and I believe there's a reason that I was supposed to be there that day. And discovering that reason became Pete Elliott's mission as a detective. Faith, some good police work, and maybe some lucky breaks, Elliott believed, would crack the case. So when the police drawing failed to turn up any suspects, Elliott tried to run a trace on the 13 weapons which had been in the locker with the dynamite. The trouble was most were so old they were untraceable, all except for the Winchester-type rifle with that unique carving on the stock. And that traced back to a female that um, was no longer residing in the Cleveland area. The woman who bought the rifle was now living in rural West Virginia. So with his composite in hand, Elliot set off to find her, driving through the hills and valleys of Appalachia. He spent hours looking for the right house, daring to think he was about to arrest the woman who had rented the locker. And I'm thinking, wow, this is a quick case. It's over. We've got her. But the woman who answered the door not only didn't match the composite, she also didn't know anything about a storage locker or about the dynamite inside. So I'm figuring at that point you're going, well, this might have been a lot of wasted uh, gas spent going to West Virginia. Right. Uh, so Until we sat down and talked with her. The woman did know something about the rifle with the unusual carving on the stock. She said her son had sold the gun to her old boss, a man whom she knew by the nickname Moose. Moose owned a convenience store near Cleveland, the one with the same address that had been listed on the storage locker rental agreement. All of a sudden, out here in the middle of West Virginia, there's the address again. Right. Now I'm betting the hairs on the back of your neck are starting to stand up. Absolutely. Really? Yeah. I knew I was onto something then. As soon as he got back to Cleveland, Elliot ran a check on the store's owner, whose last name was Topolian. And a search of Ohio driver's license records turned up a woman named Lucy Topolian, whose description sounded very familiar. Five foot two, slender build, dark hair, dark eyes, age, in her 50s now. Um, all that matched up to Lucy Topolian. To be sure he was on the right track, he compared the handwriting on the storage locker lease with the signature on Lucy Topolian's apartment lease. An expert said it was a match. The same person had signed both documents. So within a month and two days after you opened the storage unit, you know who the woman is? Absolutely. Now how are you feeling in your gut? We knew. We knew we had her then. But why? Why would a female have 200 pounds of explosives, 13 firearms, a trench coat, all this stuff? Why? So we had to find out. By October of 1996, just a month after a deadly mystery nearly exploded in the town of Bedford, Ohio, Pete Elliott thought he'd solved it. He had developed important clues about one of the rifles that had been confiscated. And armed with a composite, he and Detective Tim Alexiak went to the suburban Cleveland apartment of Lucy Topolian, the woman they believed had rented the storage locker. It was a tense moment. We knock on the door, a female answers, and it was pretty astonishing that after all that time, she still looked very similar to that composite. And uh, that was a huge break, and you want, to, you want to jump out of your skin at that time, but you can't. Once again, just like when you went to the door in West Virginia, you were praying as an investigator that we were going to see a short, kind of salt-and-pepper-haired, in her right. 50s, Mediterranean-looking lady, right? Right. Did we find her? We found her. More surprising than what she looked like is what she had to say. Lucy was once married to Murad Topalian the owner of the convenience store, whose nickname she said was Moose. Her former husband had asked her to secretly rent the locker, but she insisted she never knew what was inside. She had used fake names to cover herself, but Pete Elliott was still skeptical. Lucy lied when she rented the locker. How could he be sure she wasn't lying now? I wanted to corroborate what Lucy Topian was saying, and uh, we had her place a phone call to her ex-husband, who is now residing in Miami. Hello? Is Mood out there? Yeah, hold on, I'm for you. Okay, thank you. How did you convince her to do something like that? She was scared to death at that time, uh, agreed to cooperate, um, especially when we told her that the storage unit 
where it was, across from a daycare center. She couldn't believe it. The two investigators listened in on the conversation as Lucy talked to an abruptly uneasy Murad. Yeah, listen, the police were here earlier today. Like, they were asking me questions about that storage locker in Bedford. Why didn't you tell me what stuff was in there? Oh, Lucy. What? I'm scared to death. Oh, man. There was enough explosives in that room to blow up the whole friggin' block. Jesus, God. I mean... Lucy, please, 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 I'll fall, fly back up there and I'll talk to you, but not over the phone, please, for your sake, for my sake and for the kid's sake. His willingness to take a flight back up to Cleveland as soon as he could to talk to her in person, to me that sends all the keys in the world that something's wrong here. We were both thinking, I think we were both thinking the same thing. He knows what's going on and there's a lot more to this story and we're going to find out what it is. Napoleon flew to Cleveland the very next day, and realizing that she herself might be facing charges, Lucy agreed to wear a wire to a breakfast meeting with her former husband. I'm the one that's going to get screwed. The two investigators hoped to hear Topolian tell all as they listened from the parking lot of this restaurant outside Cleveland. I didn't know what was in there. You didn't know what was in there? Who put it in there? You have to know that. Yeah, yeah. Somebody would have asked me to let that um, and they said, just forget about it. We didn't know there were gun, guns and ammunition. Everything he said was suspicious. But more than that, it was cautious. Pete Elliott could hear that Topolian was saying nothing incriminating. There was no federal case to be made yet. We didn't have any concrete evidence that he was the one responsible um, for the inside contents of that storage unit. So we had a big hurdle to go over. As the conversation inside the restaurant went on, the two investigators heard tantalizing hints that this Murad Tapalian had a mysterious sideline and previous brushes with the feds. Elliot was flabbergasted. Why would the FBI have been so interested in this convenience store owner? And as he talked, Tapalian himself seemed to be acting like he was some kind of target. Why would they want to get you? Because I'm the head of the Armenian National Committee. The Armenian National Committee. The two listening investigators drew a blank. I had no idea where Armenia was, to be honest. I didn't know anything about Armenia at that point. You know where it is now. Oh, yeah. The investigators were now entering uncharted waters. The door to that storage locker full of explosives had suddenly opened onto a world of twisted global politics. The two investigators would soon get a crash course in geography and history to learn of a century-old hatred with roots half a world away. Armenia is a small country, once part of the Soviet Union, which sits between the Caspian and Black Seas. But the Armenian people have historically laid claim to a much larger area, including part of present-day Turkey. The dispute between the Armenians and the Turks erupted into one of the bloodiest ethnic conflicts of the 20th century. The Armenians accused the Turks of murdering up to one and a half million Armenians between 1915 and 1923. It was an ethnic cleansing operation that many historians believe was the worst case of genocide before the Holocaust. The Turks dispute the number of people killed, and they reject accusations of genocide. The killings and the history remain largely unknown to a global audience. But it is the defining historical event for one million Americans of Armenian descent. People like Murad Tapalian, whose family lived in Armenia at the time of the killings. His grandparents were tortured and hanged by the Turks. I miss 